and this is my 27th video discussing 1950s British science fiction paperbacks. Now in my uh, past uh, videos I've uh, been taking you on a trek through the mushroom jungle showing you the good, the bad and the ugly books of these publishers. But some of these publishers were very evanescent, evanescent like mushrooms, yet a day gone tomorrow. But some of them lasted. So I thought in this video and in some future videos, I'll take a closer look at some of the more important and significant publishers, such as this first one, which was Hamilton and Company, brackets Stafford, brackets Limited, who were the progenitors of the highly regarded Panther books. So let's take a look at these progenitors. Now here we see uh, Hamilton's publisher, Hamilton and Company, Stafford Limited. Now Hamilton's had only briefly dabbled with science fiction in the late 40s and made pretty much a complete hash of it as I showed in an earlier video which some of you may remember. But in the autumn of 1950 they launched their first full-blooded determined attempt they headhunted the UK's only full-time science fiction writer, John Russell Fern, offering him the unheard-of rate of 30 shillings per thousand words, double the regular payment scale. As I showed in an earlier video, Edgar Rice Burroughs was then the UK's best-selling genre writer with his Tarzan and science fiction titles, and Fern was commissioned to create a series of four books imitating the style of Burroughs' John Carter of Mars series. We see them here, the Clayton Drew Emperor of Mars Quartet, all with garish but luridly attractive covers by Terry Maloney, Emperor of Mars, Warrior of Mars, Red Man of Mars, and Goddess of Mars, which were all published simultaneously. They were all complete in themselves, but formed a continuous narrative. Their Burroughs elements included both green Martians and a superior race of red Martians, underground cities, lost races, monstrous life forms, and plot intrigues involving brain and body transplants. But Fern's novels were not merely pastitious of Burroughs, they had an added dimension of Fern's own canon of classic science fiction themes and plots, which he himself had pioneered in the 1930s American pulp magazines, including in the area Interplanetary Atlantis Survivors, The Theft of Planetary Atmospheres, which we looked at in an earlier video, Invasive Alien Spores Poisoning Venus, ditto, and Travel into the Microcosm. We can see some of these elements here in these new 1995 Griffin Books reprint editions with Ron Turner covers. Here, for instance, we see the brain of Venus that Fern had created as the cover story for this 1937 Thrill and Wonder stories. There it is, Fern's brain of, brain of Venus with this uh, Howard Brown cover. And if we look inside, we see the illustrations by uh, Mark uh, Marcioni the uh, illustrator of this issue. And there you see the brain throbbing in the Venusian undergrowth. So. Now then. Hamilton had planned a continued series, but it was cut short when Hamilton's main publishing rival, Sky Unlimited, convinced Fern to sign a five-year contract to write for them exclusively as Vargo Staten. So that was the end of Clayton Drew. But if you want to know more about uh, Gary's reprint series, you can check them out on his YouTube uh, video. That's there. Now, what have we got here? Hamilton's were determined to continue the science fiction line, 
but they were struggling to find authors with Fern's background knowledge of the medium. As I showed in an earlier video, number eight, they'd launched the mediocre short novel series, Authentic Science Fiction series, in January 1951, but this had been transformed into a monthly short story magazine by the end of the year. So they couldn't print any more short novels. So the decision evidently had been made in some haste with the result that Hamilton's had in their inventory a number of already purchased short novels that had been intended for the authentic series, but now they couldn't be used. Bear with me. I get them out. This uh, twelve. Here we see that what they did was they used their unused inventory of short novels that they bought for Authentic, they used them up and they issued them as part of their regular novels line. And they appeared contemporaneously with the magazine, which was advertised in their pages. Let's see. For them. There we are. That was the new authentic uh, science fiction short story magazine, which they advertised in the back of their novels. The first eight titles were published in September 1951 with Hamilton's distinctive red banner at the bottom there. We never publish a dull story on the covers, which alas wasn't true, because as part of the first authentic series, they were a very mixed bag, varying widely from pretty good to utter and complete crap. The same applied to the covers, which initially were, were done by uh, George Radcliffe, uh, not his best work for the most part. Now we see here that for the first two Roy Sheldon titles, the publisher had added the, uh, the logo on the cover there, the legend Prehistoric Series. And the house ads inside listed all the titles as their Science and Prehistoric Series. These were all just listed as the Science Series, but when they launched the Prehistoric, they called it the Science and prehistoric series. Now let's see what, what we'll make of these books. Space Beam by John Robb is badly dated. It's not worth reading. The opening is clearly derived from the film Destination Moon with a privately constructed first moon rocket. A brief note of novelty is injected after the takeoff for the moon when a member of the crew turns out to be a treacherous Martian albeit entirely human looking and speaking perfect English, who pulls a gun and orders the ship to be diverted to Venus, where the Martians are building an invasion base to attack the Earth. Once Venus is reached, the story degenerates into a preposterous poor man's Flash Gordon scenario, and we are told that the gravity on Venus is only 50% that of Earth, showing how little the author knew about science and science fiction. However, the author turned out to be a very talented novelist when he switched to writing crime and foreign legion thrillers based on his own wartime experiences. His uh, many foreign legion books for Hamilton's were bestsellers and they're well worth reading. In fact, I was able to get lots of them re reprinted when I became a uh, the agent for John Robb's uh, daughter uh, in recent years, and they were reprinted uh, by both uh, Linford Mystery, and see just a couple of them here, there was many more, and also by Endeavour Press.
Dark Side of Venus by Clem McCartney. The pseudonym of Irish journalist William Flax was even worse, much worse. It is juvenile jingoistic claptrap involving hackneyed belligerent Martians laying plans for yet another Earth invasion from Venus. The invaders are foiled by young Dan Fury, one of the most decorated young pilots in the British Air Command. The author seemed to have derived these SF ideas from UK boys comics like The Wizard or The Rover. Much better here. Return to Earth was by the very talented 22-year-old Brian Berry. Following atomic war on Earth, mankind has established a colony on Venus. With the passing centuries, the colonists have forgotten their savage ancestry. But then one of them visits the ancient First Library and recovers the forbidden old books, resulting in a return to his home planet and conflict with the mutant race that has developed on the Earth in their absence. The book has some disturbing visceral violence, but it was a big jump in quality. Jewel in Nightmare Worlds was another rotten dud by William Flax. Here writing is B for Billy. Silly Billy. It's an incredibly ill-written space opera describing the ludicrous battles of a British space hero to prevent the occupation of Venus by the Mercutians as well as conquering Mercury itself, both planets having natives, the Venies and the Mercs. Pass the sick bag. This planet for sale by George Hay was a big improvement. It's a light-hearted satirical space opera detailing the study of federal forces against Starways Incorporated, a tyrannical private organisation uh, exploiting other planets. One of its amusing central characters is an android called Pomfrey. Flight of the Hesper was perhaps his best novel. It tells of a giant starship heading into deep space on an exploratory mission on the generation ship principle. He expertly describes how tensions develop between the original crew and the second generation. An attempted landing and colonisation of an extrasolar planet is doomed because the crew suffer from agoraphobia. The story climaxes when one man battles against the ship's computer, which is sentient and controlling the human captain. It's a hidden gem of the Mushroom era, foreshadowing Arthur C. Clarke's HAL in 2001. Now the problem with the first prehistoric title, Moment Out of Time by Roy Sheldon, was its ridiculous cost of, cast of characters. The plot involves a party of time travellers whose time machine loses all body, all power, stranding them in the Jurassic Age, as illustrated on the John Pollock cover. But only a couple of the nine men and four women are scientists. The rest of them are atrocious gangsters and their molds, for which a very unlikely rationale is offered. As most of the gangsters are idiots, their silly yammering prompts the responses of the scientists to assume an air of condescension and superiority, which is irritating to read. The best parts of the narrative are provided by the more intelligent scientist commenting on the flora and fauna of the Jurassic period. However, the possibility of an interesting novel describing how modern humans might battle to adapt and survive in a prehistoric era is largely wasted because the gangsters quickly fight amongst themselves and most of them end up shooting each other. The potential for suspense and sexual tensions with only a few men and lots uh, only a few women rather and lots of men dot 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 is not realized as after the killings we end up with three Adams and three Eves, at which point the novel ends abruptly. Now, George Hayes went on record that Hamilton's owner, Harry Asiel, had asked him to write the first prehistoric novel, but then angrily rejected the result and passed the assignment to another writer, thought to be Bert Campbell. He was so upset he quit writing altogether. One wonders if the silly idea of gangster time travellers had been Asiel's. Mammoth Man was by H.J. Campbell, writing as Roy Sheldon and was the first adventure of Magda, the 
the Pleistocene age caveman, together with his friend Garo. This simple and smoothly written story tells how Magda finds her mate, Lena. He hunts, fights rival cavemen, and escapes a herd of rampaging mammoths. Two Days of Terror continues the prehistoric adventures of Magda, his mate Lena, and the friend Garo, who eventually dies tragically. Interesting, the novel was not billed as a prehistoric story, with the label being dropped. With this title, the designation Panther Books was created for the first time, and this together with the next three titles, also had uniform black spines, which gave the books a rather classy appearance. This novel has a short uh, prologue and an epilogue, presumably in an attempt to give it a science fiction flavour, describing how one Professor Eckhart, Eckhart, that's him on the cover there, is operating his time probe to view the racial memories of a primitive modern man, thus giving us the adventures of his caveman ancestor, Magda. The closing scene with Eckert is illustrated in Ron Turner's striking cover. The most interesting thing about this book is that the plot device of viewing racial memories of reincarnation would appear to have been plagiarised from Professor Lumiere's Recapitulator in the famous Daily Mirror comic strip Goth by Don Freeman and Steve Dowling. Here we see a 1944 sequence from the Island Laboratory. Just take a look at this penultimate page. Now then. Here we see this sequence in which uh, Professor Lumia invents his uh, scientific device, the recapitulator, and sends Sir uh, Garth into a trance and sees, sees his earlier life. Incidentally, if anyone is interested in the science fiction adventures of Garth, you can find my fully detailed, fully illustrated essays on his classic early stories on YouTube. Just search Garth Strips Checklist on John Freeman's Down the Tube site. On to the next book. Space Treason by Ken Bulmer was written in collaboration with his friend and flatmate Vincent Clark, who became revered as a science fiction fan writer rather than as an evanescent novelist. Its space action cover by Gordon Davies clearly announced that Hamilton had abandoned the prehistoric series and were now on a purely science fiction basis. This was typical early Bulmer, fast-paced space opera, full of chases, captures and escapes across the solar system, with established characters and institutions not being what they seem. But it's disappointingly trivial, with actual science fiction ideas only lightly brushed in, in this case a matter transmitter but Bulmer would improve mightily later on. Now, uh, And the Stars Remain by Brian Berry was a really fine story, worthy of its wonderful Gordon Davies cover. This atmospheric story tells of the first Earth spaceship to attempt to break the light barrier and explore interstellar space. The ship launches in glory, the events watched phlegmatically by the enigmatic ancient Martians. Nothing more is heard from the starship until a couple of years, years later, a couple of years later rather, a fragment of the ship's hull drifts back into the solar system. On it are scarring marks as if some giant hand had crushed the vessel. What had become of its crew? A faction of the Martians is sympathetic to the disconcerted Earth authorities and clandestinely makes available one of their secret scientific devices, a time brain, to help them discover what had happened to the starship. Just what this is makes engrossing reading, a story of cosmic transcendence that uncannily anticipates Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood End and 2001. It's another gem from the Mushroom Jungle. 
Now, Adam Warren Mars, with another strike in Davies' cover, further underlined the fact that the Hamilton line was now delivering quality science fiction. Tobe's dynamic novel tells of the invention of a new system of space travel, the Merrill Tube. Using the invention, the Martian colony declares its independence and overthrows the dictatorship of Earth. An early tub exploration of one of his favourite themes, a fresh start for humanity. These books, these four books here, also marked a fresh start for Hamilton's, who were now rebranded themselves as Panther Books, a cut above their competitors. And even more changes and improvements, including the introduction of more pages and hardcover editions, were to follow. But that must wait for another video.